Hi! So here we are for our second week. This is the part on Dionysus and so we'll start with the class uh, about uh, uh, Dionysus himself and then in the next we will uh, talk about Pan, Eco and Narcissus. Let's go! So about the gods' birth, childhood and origins Let's see uh, his birth first. So, Dionysus, uh, uh, you for sure know, that was for the Romans uh, Bacchus, so they pre uh, prefer this name for the same god. So, Zeus is uh, father of Dionysus and uh, disguised as a mortal loved Selene, that was uh, a princess, was daughter of the king of Thebes, Cadmus, and uh, so after that uh, Zeus loved Semele, Hera, uh, jealous as usual, appeared to her and convinced her uh, to trick Zeus and ask him to reveal himself to her in the full magnificent of his divinity. You can see what happened to Semele in the picture on the right. So, in fact, Semele was burned hmm, by the splendor of the divinity of Zeus uh, and uh, the flash, the lightning coming from him. But Semele was pregnant and so uh, the unborn child was saved by Zeus, doing what? Sewing him up in his tight uh, to then be burned at the proper time. So you see again that uh, uh, according to the Greeks, it uh, was not important to have uh, a mother, uh, but the most responsible for the birth of children were considered fathers uh, and uh, this meets uh, as this one, the meets as this one um, are re revealing exactly uh, this social belief. So then what happened? Dionysus was brought by nymphs and by Semele's uh, sister, Eno, on the mountains, as, as usually for divine uh, children. The mountain was named Nisa, uh, but we don't know exactly where uh, it was because uh, uh, according to historical sources and meteorological sources, it's variously located. So then <clears throat> from uh, the regions uh, where probably this mountain was located, uh, Phrygia or Trace, uh, he came to Greece. Uh, and uh, so he is uh, a latecomer uh, for this reason uh, f um, to the Olympian pantheon, to, to the group of gods of the Olympus. So is uh, later than others. Then, the nature of this god, he is mainly bringing happiness and salvation. This is very important, but for those who accept him peacefully. So we will see this in the back key too by Euripides. And for those who not accepted him, he brought madness and death. So the nature of the god had this duality. Uh, he was very hard with those who didn't accept his cult. But remember, he brought salvation. So this is proper of the mystery religions. So in the Bacchae, we under, 
understand very well this, so it's fundamental, this play by Euripides, uh, for understanding uh, the god himself uh, and his worship and cult. You can see here a very famous uh, painting by Caravaggio called Bacchus, uh, so uh, showing um, Dionysus with his main attributes. Because Dionysus uh, is considered god of vegetation in general, but in particular of the vine, the grape, and consequently the making and drinking of wine with all the um, consequences of the drinking of wine, so exhilaration and release that wine can bring. So, because of this, in Dionysus um, lie both the bestial, so the irrational nature, and the sublime. Hmm? because of the ecstasy cre created by this exhilaration, but a kind of excessive release too. Here you can see in the picture below a part of the incredible frescoes that are uh, in the Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii. So, uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, these frescoes displaying all the story uh, of uh, this girl coming to uh, her wedding, passing through the mysteries of Dionysus. So we can see the girl on the right and on the left uh, in all scenes, uh, and then we can see, for example, in the center, some uh, uh, creatures as the uh, Sileni uh, of uh, uh, Dionysus' uh, court and entourage. So Dionysus represents the emotional uh, and the rational in human beings. Very important. Uh, so um, it's a, a form of cult uh, uh, that's particularly interesting. So, this uh, kind of uh, emotions and irrationalities uh, um, drove um, the followers uh, and the worshippers of Dionysus to um, mob, fury, fanaticism many times, and violence too, but also to the sublime, so the highest ecstasy of mysticism and religious experience, uh, different from other cults. So, he is one of the gods of mystery religions, uh, and important had uh, a message of salvation. The mystery religions uh, are described in the chapter of our textbook, uh, chapter 14, where we can see the cult of the matter and the so-called Eleusian mysteries. And then in chapter 16, what is called Orphism, related to the mythological character Orpheus, uh, and especially to mystery religions in Roman times. So it's important, uh, uh, please review these two chapters. Then, salvation, so a benevolent God in this sense. Let's see uh, how, especially uh, with uh, this side story of Ariadne. Ariadne uh, gave to the hero Theseus a thread, <clears throat> a thread that uh, was helpful then for him to find his way out uh, the, uh, the labyrinth uh, after killing the Minotaur. So, 
He he was married to Ariadne and uh, she escaped with him from the island of Crete where do you remember there was the labyrinth of King Minos and uh, uh, there was uh, trapped the Minotaur. But then Theseus abandoned her on the island of Naxos. So for sure Ariadne at this point uh, was desperate and alone uh, and uh, Dionysus his, himself uh, uh, came and rescued her. So and um, uh, for uh, as a gift uh, and uh, um, to uh, as an act of pity he placed the wrath that she wore in the heavens. So this wrath uh, became the constellation of Corona. So it's incredible to hear this name today with the coronavirus but Corona means wrath and so uh, Corona is the constellation uh, connected to the story of Ariadne. This girl uh, found so deliverance uh, through a god and not through a hero. And this is a story of salvation, exactly, illustrating so the love and compassion of this god Dionysus uh, that we uh, can describe again as a benevolent god of the mysteries uh, and that inspired uh, a lot of works of art. Yeah, let's see the followers and the nature of the religion and the attributes of Dionysus. So essential to his worship was the spiritual release that was not coming only through wine but through music and dance too as we can see in this picture below. So in the history of religion every and each archetypal behavior uh, asked for music and dance and was uh, uh, essential for most of uh, the rituals that um, uh, needed exaltation. In his ceremonies, the god took possession of worshippers. So when possessed, the worshippers ate raw flesh of the sacrificial animal and this was a kind of ritual communion because they believed that the god uh, was present in the victim so they could be connected physically with him. This ceremony was called homophagy and uh, uh, the religious congregation, so the group of the followers, was known as the Holy Theasus. But let's see, female followers are called the Bacchi, so the title two of the tragedy by Euripides that we are going to study next. Uh, these are mortal, mortal women, who became possessed by the god. They can be called two manats and these two names were also given to mythological nymphs, as you know spirits of nature, who follow uh, Dionysus. Let's see the male counterparts called the satyrs. They were the male counterparts of Menads and Bacchi and uh, they were not completely mortal because they were half uh, men and half animals. As you can see in the picture, so this painted Greek um, vessel, they had an horse tail usually and then ears and uh, uh, God's birds and horns. The old 
satires were called sileni. Usually all of them were depicted nude and sometimes uh, uh, sexually excited. The sileni, so the old satires, uh, um, were sometimes uh, very wise because uh, uh, an elder in general is uh, why, uh, wiser than uh, the youngs. So the um, followers had the attributes of Dionysus, so animal skins and garlands uh, were uh, typical. Then they carry the most characteristic attribute of the god Dionysus, called the Tirsus. There was a pole, as you can see in the picture below, red with ivy or vine leaves, and then at the top with a pine cone. So this pole could be a deadly weapon or become a magic wand through which uh, was possible to perform miracles. So then let's see the relationship in between Dionysus and Apollo. That is mostly because of music. So Dionysus had uh, a kind of music that was emotionally noisy uh, and making clash and uh, so creating unrestrained freedom and passion through his, in his worship. So on the opposite hand, uh, there was the music of Apollo. So that was uh, playing the lyre, so creating a disciplinated melody connected with reason and self-control. So this opposition in between the gods, these two gods, is very important. Here you can see the distinction. So these are the two antithetical forces, uh, one of the irrational, called Dionysian or Dionysiac, and rational one, the rational one, the Apollonian one, so having completely opposite characteristics. So you see the Apollonian um, characteristics are dreamlike, pleasurable, ordered, historical, logical and static. The Dionysiac one is moving, ecstatic, painful, chaotic, primordial and musical. So these are the dominant archetypal motives inherent into human nature. And uh, the author who mostly uh, explained this uh, and gave particular importance uh, uh, and then influence uh, to this uh, uh, duality uh, is Friedrich Nietzsche, so the modern philosophers uh, in his study of drama entitled the birth of tragedy. Okay, so this is the end of the first part on Dionysus. See you in the next. Bye!